Hello, welcome to the webinar. My name is Dave Kyle. Today's presentation is keeping yourself protected from phishing emails provided by Ease Tech. Let's take a look at our agenda. The first thing we'll be discussing is the most common cyber compromises. Secondly, we'll be talking about how this could affect you and your business. Third, we'll talk about how to recognize these phishing emails. They're, they come in many different forms and types, and we'll take a look at some examples for you to uh, understand. Finally, we'll talk about some different ways that you can keep yourself protected from all this. There's a lot of different things that could happen, and by taking certain steps, one of which is this program, you'll become better equipped to deal with phishing emails. Finally, we'll wrap things up with some Q&A. So before we get started, just cover a few terms. It's kind of helpful in the conversation uh, we'll be doing today. First one is malware. And uh, you may have heard this one. And generally, I, I use this as a broad term uh, describing any software that is programmed to be generally hostile to your computer. Uh, this is not to be confused with virus, although they're very similar. Uh, virus is actually a subset of malware. And um, kind of look at malware as kind of the overall umbrella of malicious code. Uh, virus. Virus uh, are a little more specific in how they um, replicate themselves. Another one you may have heard about and important to our situation today is called key loggers. And key loggers are designed much like um, viruses to replicate themselves on an occasion, but they're very specifically targeted to um, installing themselves and, and recording keystrokes. And then in some cases, they're then, sent, of course, sent back to um, cyber criminals to um, get access to information on your computer. Phishing is a term you may have heard. It's basically an attempt to acquire information masquerading as a trustworthy entity. A little more specific uh, to phishing is called spear phishing, where it's uh, a targeted attack on a company or an individual in an attempt to acquire information, information masquerading as a trustworthy entity as well. So I like to cover a few different types of online compromises. Um, you may have heard these in different categories. First one is where you may have seen Target, University of Maryland, a lot of big box organizations where the databases are compromised and, and millions of names and information sets are, are taken in a situation. Um, this is generally a personal information attack. They're looking for uh, credit cards, dates of birth, social security numbers, things like that that they can use and oftentimes just sell off on the uh, black market. Another one um, is ransomware, and uh, probably about a year and a half ago, a lot of the healthcare companies, and some here locally, were compromised um, with this ransomware, and I'll, I'll cover that in more detail. But it's not just healthcare companies. It's small businesses, individuals, uh, where the compromise occurs, the computer's taken over, and you're requested to provide a payment to get back access to your computer. Another one is wire transfer heist. This happens in a couple different ways. We're going to cover two variations of this. One is CEO fraud, and another one is uh, how um, someone can get into your computer, install some software, get access through a keylogger, as I mentioned, and get access to your bank information. And finally, intellectual property. We're not going to cover this one too much, only because this is um, not quite as prevalent for us and what we're supporting, but it's still pretty common. Um, mostly it's nation states, other companies going after somebody else's business and not necessarily trying to get money, but trying to get the intellectual property of that organization. So this all comes down to one common thing and that uh, seems to be happening. We talk about phishing, but this is really just about social engineering. And social engineering is the psychological manipulation of people into performing actions or divulging confidential information. I'm sure many of you have seen the movie um, Ocean's Eleven, and it's the same thing as a, a con that you've seen in a movie. You know, in Ocean's Eleven, we had a variety of actors perform uh, the actions of, of going after a, uh, a casino, and um, they stole a whole lot of money off them. You know, this is the same kind of thing, except it's done in a digital manner over um, email. And what we want to do is try to mitigate this situation for yourselves and understand what you can do to help not be socially engineered by these cyber criminals. So there's different mechanisms for social engineering. Of course, we're focusing mostly on email because 90% of all compromises occur as a result of email phishing um, that's been done. Um, and it's really the major aspect of what's going on. But some more targeted um, phishing, and especially phishing email, Spear phishing email, excuse me, is done with combinations of email and phone calls, for example. And in some cases, thumb drives. And we've also seen situations where, you know, 
criminals will go into dumpster dive, meaning that they'll go through the trash, try to find information and use that as a way to gain access through social engineering to uh, get to someone. So there's a combination of things and uh, I'd say emails, number one, of course, but phone calls to participate as a, especially in this one item called CEO fraud. So let's take a look at the ransomware, pretty common one. We see it uh, crop up and down. Mostly it started with Crypto Locker, Crypto Wall, or some of the names. Basically, hackers create a uh, series of phishing emails. Those phishing emails then are sent out to unsuspecting uh, users. Uh, they will click on something, which I'll show you some examples, or there's a website where some software is installed that's malicious. Uh, as a result of doing that, there's code that's installed on the computer. It then locks up um, your computer. And you can't use your computer until you supposedly pay them money. That's where the ransomware comes in. And then they'll give you the information, the keys to unlock that code, or the code that will unlock it, all that being encrypted for you at that point. So and recently, it's been more focused around cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Uh, again, they'll ask you to send money, and then they'll send you an email that you can unlock your computer and encrypt your hard drive. Encouraging people not to do that. FBI encourages not to do that. The way around this, once it happens to you, is uh, really good backup systems, that uh, disaster recovery that lets you get past something of this magnitude. Wire transfer CEO fraud, not as widely known, but certainly uh, pretty bad in the sense that, and I'll give you an example of the email of how this often will look, but basically it's an executive impersonation. It's targeting the finance department, and it's a combination of email and spear phishing after a couple individuals, and usually in combination with a phone call. And of course, with all these things, there's a sense of urgency, which I'll give some examples of. And ultimately, there's a bank wire transfer. So oftentimes, one scenario is a, an email will go out saying, you know, hey, Steve, this is Bill, who might be the CEO. Um, John, who's our attorney, may be calling you in about 30 minutes. And as a result of that phone call, he's going to ask and give you some information for a bank wire transfer. Um, so all this is spoofed. The email may be spoofed. The attorney is spoofed, and it's trying to create a sense of urgency to actually go out and do this in a timely manner. Um, the FBI is reporting that there are millions of dollars every week that this is happening to small and medium-sized businesses uh, around the country. It happens to all kinds of organizations, not just businesses, but to, to banks, to financial institutions, to education institutions. It's really kind of prevalent. Um, and uh, I'll give you an example of what this email may look like. A wire transfer heist is very similar to this, but it's very specific around um, what may happen and occur with uh, some malware that may be installed in your computer. So let me give an example of what this looks like. Hackers create software. Uh, they've actually, in some cases, the example I'm going to give you here was a hospital uh, in Washington that uh, got compromised. And they, they secured some home workers thinking they were doing you know, homework and getting paid. Um, they created a, a banking relationship with these home workers. They identified a couple hospitals and then sent out uh, malware to these hospitals. As a result, the hospitals installed uh, accidentally key loggers through malware on their computers, gained access to their banking information, and then started transferring money out in small amounts and ultimately in larger amounts to these home workers. Then the home workers were duped into transferring all this money back out to the hackers and uh, into these Ukrainian banks. So there's different variations of this, but ultimately wire transfer heists are a big one. In these situations, whether it would be CEO fraud or in this one, there's literally tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars being compromised. This particular hospital one uh, from a few years ago, there was a million dollars that was taken out over a period of about four or five days. So current security, uh, I mean, then we all ask ourselves, well, aren't we paying for security to have this to keep us protected? And, and you are, and we are too, and we're doing a lot of things. Ease Technologies, for example, works very hard with making sure your firewalls are updated uh, and having the right firewalls in place. Uh, having antivirus software, um, which is one of your main lines of defense, whether it be from Microsoft or from uh, additional software you pay for to keep protection in your computers. Spam filters are part of the process within your email system. So something like Office 365 has three different filtering steps to help stop spam and um, not only spam, but the phishing emails from getting through. Um, and, and then Outlook has filter uh, filters as well in the application to keep you protected. So all this is there along with patch management and patch management is simply keeping your devices and applications updated when known vulnerabilities have been identified. So that's why we are often saying, hey, you know, you've got an iPhone, um, there's a new update, security update, install it. 
And we're going to tell you that time and time again, that, you know, the security updates are critical, whether they be on your firewalls, your servers, your mobile devices, and your desktops. Uh, they're your first line of defense. But, you know, these cyber criminals are pretty crafty and they, you know, send out these phishing emails. And let me give you a few examples of what's going on. First off, they're going to send you a type of email that may have an attached malware package installed to it. And you've seen this with a zip drive, a PDF, Word documents. They seem innocuous, but really there's things inside these things that are going to, um, once opened up, you may not even realize that they're going to install information and malware to your computer that you can't even recognize. And your fire, firewalls and other aspects of and, and any virus software aren't current enough to know about these compromises and can't block them. Same thing with links to websites, I'll give you some examples of these, and then uh, links that will trick you into giving your email information and, and passwords to them as well. And finally, there's fraudulent email impersonation. That's some of the things I described to you with the um, CEO fraud. So let's take a look at some of these, uh, some examples to learn about um, what they're doing and in some steps you can you know, do to recognize a fraudulent uh, fishy email coming through. So first off, uh, this was one that um, I got, I'm going to show you a few over the last few years. The sender was AT&T voicemail. Well, first off, I don't have AT&T voicemail from anything. So this is the first time it ever showed up. It seemed kind of odd. Secondly, who's this going to? Why would an email be going to five or six people? Okay. Um, there's an attachment. Another flag for me seeing what's going on. And this was a pretty bad one. It had wrong date. This happened in a number of years ago, but the date at the bottom was wrong as well. And finally, it says, you know, contact us for missing information. Well, there was no information in there or phone number to contact. So right away, you know, you're looking at an email that's fraudulent. Let's take another one. This is a, an important one, I think, to recognize. Uh, this is one from Bank of America, supposedly. And it was to an employee of the company, here are these technologies. But right away, it had a zip file, which is, again, a flag for me. Um, I mean, I'm looking at the email, and the, the area code isn't correct. But the thing that's probably more important is the sense of urgency on here. And in this last paragraph, um, it's identifying that someone needs to take action on this by 10 a.m. the next morning. The email went out at 5 a.m., so it's really one business hour. So it's trying to trick someone who's maybe just leaving the office into just clicking on it. They're not actually looking for someone to send um, this, uh, any money. They're just looking for you to click on that zip file that will actually install the malware they want to attach into your computer. So all they want to do is just have you click on the, the attachment. And that sense of urgency is the thing that they're trying to have you do. Another one, Wells Fargo Online, a uh, big thing here was that the address was incorrect, who the recipient was incorrect. Actually, if you look on, if the, uh, the from uh, email was incorrect as well. Again, sense of urgency uh, on the conversation. There's a code of HTM, which is an H could take you to a bad website. So there's a lot of things in there that were bad about that email. I want to explain this one healthcare hack that happened a number of years ago. Uh, this is actually uh, an attack on three of the biggest healthcare providers. And what you need to learn from this one is this was an email phishing that they did to these three organizations across a number of employees. What they did was create fake domains, websites. And instead of an example of care first, instead of having the I in first, they um, got a website together that had an exclamation point. So as a result of this, the care first website they thought they were going to was a malicious website. And what they were able to do was get access to a whole number of username and passwords to get access to what ultimately was personal information of about 120 million users across the country. So this technique was identified on all three of these particular companies. And it's a pretty common one where somebody's going to spoof something, whether it be an email address, whether it be a website. So again, you really need to pay attention to the different things that are being sent to you. Here's an email I got just recently. Um, looks pretty good. They probably screen captured a lot of this. And uh, it was from Bank of America. Big thing for me right away was the address was incomplete. You know, and undisclosed recipients. Okay, well, if it was going to go to me, it should be addressed to me. Uh, the other thing here was that, again, it's a sense of urgency, trying to make me um, recognize that I need to do something right away. So it's almost like a panic thing. Anytime you're, you're sent into a, an aspect, uh, a scenario where you're panicked a little bit, you've got to slow down and stop, especially when an email is going to tell you to do something right away. Uh, also in here, there's a link. Now, what I did for this one is I did click on the link to, for demonstration purposes for us. So again, this was email phishing. 
This is part one. Part two of the situation here was this took me to a website when I hit that link. And again, this was a fake website. And I can tell that right away by looking at the URL across the top. This was not you know, Bank of America. It was 9 by 9 alerts and another address that was completely incorrect. The attempt here was to gain access to my um, information that they could get to my uh, email as well as the passcode for my website to Bank of America. All right, let's take a look at another one. This one came recently as well. And uh, this particular email phishing was um, I call it a DocuSign uh, attack. And basically this has been going on for about a year and a half. And again, some of these um, malware and email phishing attacks, they, they resurge back and forth. So this really started about a year and a half ago. Hadn't seen it for a while and seems to be very pervasive right now. What ends up happening is there's a link to malware. You get this email, you click on the link, um, you ultimately then install this software and to and it goes out to a whole bunch of other people as well. So it's self-replicating as not only is it, is it bad malware, but it's replicating across many other users that you may have access to. So this was a good email address from someone I knew, but it was the link I knew was you know, a problem. And it just seemed like a really odd email. And again, there's a sense of urgency in the email as well. Um, this is one of those ones that is really going to be pay attention to because this particular email came from my business partner, Chuck Bubeck, and um, the email did look good. Now, the thing about this was that it came in at 9 o'clock at night. So, again, a little bit odd to have Chuck send me an email, ask me for a wire transfer. Flags are going off for me at this point. Um, now, also, there was a, um, a banner across here that said, hey, we think this may be a fraudulent email, which... Um, was nice, but you know, some people may overlook something like that and continue to follow through the request here. And the request is simply, hey, send me a reply back. I'm going to send you some, I need to get information about doing a wire transfer with you. Now, Chuck and I wouldn't have done it this way. So it's certainly, you know, not the right thing to have happened. But if you're in this role, you may see an email from the CEO saying, hey, reply back to me if you're around so we can engage in a wire transfer. And that, at that point, they're going to go after you. So, and the other one I saw on this too, there was it was missing a, an email address to me. So again, there's very common things you're going to see in these emails that are fraudulent. I want to bring this one up because this is a, a very important one with the IRS. Um, you know, going forward, starting after the new year, the IRS does not communicate to taxpayers through email, for example. And looking at this one email, for example, it came from IRS.com, which would be fraudulent, for example. Um, so there's a lot of information in here that looks good. They probably scraped it from a real email or a website. This looks more like a website to me than anything else, but they scraped it and made it look like an email. And there's a link inside here that would have taken you probably to a bad site that could have installed some malware on your computer. So let's talk about is it fishy? Um, you know, there's some things I've shown you in some of the emails. Let's review some of these. Uh, first off, do you know the sender of the email? Um, is there a sense of urgency in the subject line or email body? Those are always things that are going to try to uh, push you or, or, or entice you to do something quickly. Is that sense of urgency? Is the email sent to the correct address? Is it yours? Is it somebody else? Um, are there any attachments or links? Again, all flags you need to be thinking about when looking at an email. Does the email require personal information? Does the email contain spelling or grammatical errors? And... Um, have you checked the link? And I'm going to show you how to do this real quick as best I can with another screenshot. Uh, basically, it's mousing over a URL in an email. Um, again, important to the message here. Do not click, but simply mouse over. And right here, I'm not sure if you can see this. I'll bring the mouse over. But if you see that link there, it says reactivate your account. And when I did that, a little pop-up happens, whether you're using Outlook or any number of packages that will show you the URL that that link is going to. Important not to click. But when that pop-up does occur, you can see that in this case, it was not going to Wells Fargo. It was going to um, another uh, website altogether. So clearly uh, a malicious link and, and a phishing email. So if it looks fishy, what do you need to do? Well, first off, as I said a couple times, and this is the most critical thing, do not click on anything. Uh, if you feel it's a phishing email, you can just simply delete it. Um, if you are corresponding with someone and you know who they are or an organization, you can simply give them a call. Now, in 
the, pers the, the most important thing of this is do not use the phone number that may be provided in that email. You need either go to your contacts database, call them directly, or if it's an organization like a bank, look up their phone number, look in the back of your credit card and call them that way and not by anything that's been provided in the email. And if you're uncertain, contact the East, the East Tech Help Desk. We'd be happy to help you out and determine what the situation is. You can't delete it though, we can't help you unless you still have that email. You can, I mean, you can't remove it completely. You can put it in, the, in your delete folder or, or just not touch us or, uh, and contact us. We'd be more than happy to help you out. Uh, and we've done that for a lot of folks. More often than not though, it's, it's something that is um, a phishing email and you wanna make sure you stay away from it by all costs. Um, so a couple more things here for us that are really going to be helpful. So we shared with you a lot of different examples of what bad and inappropriate emails are, are out there from a phishing standpoint and examples of what they're doing. But there's some things you can do along with your passwords to help keep yourself protected going forward. So first off, and we say this a lot, but I'm going to say it again, use long, complex passwords. Now, I know this seems difficult to work with, but it's the best protection that you have. Um, I don't know how many times we hear about someone's password being password or one, two, three, four, five, six. And those are the two most popular passwords that are out there and um, can't tell you how often people have been compromised as a result of that. Different site passwords are critical too. So what you use on Facebook, what you use for your bank, what you use for your email, all need to be different, which is very complicated, but we then suggest using um, password manager to help you manage some of that, especially when we encourage you to do password changes um, as much as you should be doing. I, for example, at the end of the year, I'm always reviewing my passwords, especially on key accounts and making sure I change all those passwords if I haven't done so earlier in the year. You want to auto lock your devices and that means your phone, your tablets, um, you know, even your, your desktop computer. So after a certain number of minutes, you may walk away from that device. You want to make sure that's locked up uh, quickly. And finally, another not finally, but another factor for all this is what's called multi-factor or two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication is a way for you to uh, get a, an extra set of information along with your email and your password sent to you. So, for example, if you're using uh, your bank, you can turn on two-factor authentication, and when you do so, they'll send you a text message to your cell phone uh, requiring you to enter a series of code into the website along with those other authentication methods to make sure that the, you are who you are. So two factors are an important setting to turn on. Um, the final thing I want to recommend is review your email security settings uh, across all your uh, web devices, so, I mean web programs. So review your email security settings in like Facebook. Um, you may find that you have more additional security options that you don't have turned on. And if you take the time, you can flip those switches to make your um, Facebook, bank, um, even email more secure than you already have right now today. So let's take a, a few questions and answers. Uh, we had a, a few uh, sent in earlier, one of which was, um, should, we, should our office implement a no-click policy on links? Um, I, I would say that's a tough one, and each business is going to be a little bit different. Um, your organization may require you to uh, handle um, PDFs. What you may want to do is work on a method that you use other uh, ways of sharing documents that mitigate the amount of uh, documents like PDFs and Excel documents being shared, a program like ShareFile, so you're eliminating that. But each business is going to be different. Um, there's other methods that people are going to get to you uh, other than just attachments, but I'd say you know, good education as we're doing right now today. Uh, having a, a good process of making sure your security uh, settings with your firewalls, um, updates to your um, email um, um, applications are all important. But uh, I'd say talk to Chris, who's your account manager, and see if that's going to be a successful process for you. And even if you do say don't check, you know, click on an email that has an attachment, somebody still may do it anyway. So I think you need to make sure that other security measures are in place for yourself. Um, uh, alerting co-workers to sus suspect emails. Well, I would suggest that if you have other co-workers uh, that you think uh, about these situations or they have an, an inc incident that happens in your own organization, probably phone calls or voicemail messages are your best bet, especially if you may think you may be infected or you've infected somebody else or something's going on. Um, sending out other emails may only cause problems for yourself if you are already infected with a virus or a malware. I'm going to take a quick look. See if we have some other questions. 
<clears throat> password manager was a question. Um, yeah, so a couple of things about password managers. Um, East Technologies um, is working with each of you on implementing some password managers. From a business standpoint, we're working with a program called Auth Anvil. And um, if you have been approached, you should be approached by Chris Bubeck about using a program like this. And I highly recommend it, you use it as a business. Another personal one to use, and I use this pretty regularly, uh, is called 1Password. And I've had a lot of success with that one uh, from a personal standpoint. And even, you know, I have 100 personal emails, uh, addresses, and passwords that are all combinations to um, banks and all kind of things that I want to keep outside of the workplace. So even for that, I have my own personal one. Uh, look, look at another one here for us. Uh, what should be done if you click on a phishing link? I think I've shared with that already. Most important thing is to contact these technologies right away. You know, stop what you're doing, call the help desk, and we can step in and, and help provide uh, assistance to you uh, in solving the issue that you may have occurred there for you. Um, we have a couple more. Uh, I could talk about a password manager for everybody. So the question is, what do you think about logging into sites using Facebook? Uh, I think um, logging. Is, so that may be the question is, you know, using Facebook as your authentication method um, has its pros and cons. It's certainly simple to use something like that. Uh, Google provides this method as well. You may see you could get to a website and it offers you the ability to use your Facebook account to get in. I would say it would be successful depending on how good your security settings are in Facebook. Again, my name is Dave Kyle, and thank you for joining me today. If you have any more questions, you can email me at dave at eastech.com. Be sure to check out our blog at eastech.com, where we provide all kinds of great ideas and tips for you to look at and review. Finally, if you need us right away, give us a call at 301-854-0010. Thanks, and have a great day.